Welcome to the YouTube channel for Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. My name is Russell Dixon and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor here. You know, the only way we can bring messages like the one you're about to watch, both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast is through the generosity of not only our church family, but also of you, our extended family. So if you would like to contribute to help support the work that God is doing through this ministry financially, you can go to our website at sunsetcanyonchurch.org and simply click on the button that says give. We hope that this week's message encourages you to seek Jesus, and we pray that it helps you to grow in your walk with Him. Now, here's this week's message. Well, given that today is Team Spirit Day, I figured I needed to open today's time with a sports story. Um, and this story is about my sister, Megan. My sister, Megan, was quite the basketball player growing up. And uh, I was not, I'll just leave it at that. So we, uh, I, pl I did play football, basketball, and baseball. However, um, my position in basketball would usually look somewhere like right here on the bench, so I was usually like, this is what I looked like in the game, not exactly playing. And so one day we were playing in the front yard and it was a fairly close game and Megan proceeded to hit like two or three three-pointers in a row to start to put some distance between me and her. And on like the third three-pointer, she kind of crossed over and stepped back and she drained it and just held her finish there, like totally rubbing salt in the open wound. And I'm embarrassed to admit, admit to you today that it was almost in that moment like a bullseye just rested right here on her and I proceeded to shove her down. She fell down and came up and her arm was limp. She goes running inside in tears and then all of a sudden her and my dad are in the car going to the doctor. She comes back in a sling and it was not broken, it was severely sprained, but you could say my backside was severely sprained or broken. Come on, somebody. My parents, that whole verse that says, spare the rod, spoil the child, that was hung over our household doorstep, right? So, uh, and as I think about that, I am reminded of this truth in that oftentimes the more successful we are or the greater we strive to do a work, the bigger the bullseye that rests on our back. And I find that especially to be true as believers, that the more we want to serve Jesus, the enemy has a bullseye on our back. Matter of fact, I've heard it said this way, the birthmark of a believer is a bullseye. So what does that mean? That means that if you and I are striving to follow Jesus, we are going to be faced with opposition in this life. You can take it to the bank that obedience to God is always met with opposition. Matter of fact, when you look around our country now, newsflash, we don't live in a Christian country anymore. I read a study this past week from the Pew Research Center that said this, 64% of American adults do not believe America is currently a Christian nation. Now that may not be surprising to you, but what was even more surprising is that 51% of Americans believe that America should not be a Christian nation. So if they were given the choice, Christian or not Christian, over 50% said, nah, we're good. And here's what's even most staggering about that is that 50 years ago, 90% of Americans identified as Christians. So we live in a world that is opposed to the gospel. And if we are striving to follow Jesus, we have to know that we are going to face some opposition in this life. As a matter of fact, we know this to be true because our savior that we worship was so opposed by the world that they put him on a cross. 
So we shouldn't be surprised. Matter of fact, 1 John 3.13 says, do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. So we've got to know that opposition is going to come in life. And there are some pastors and churches nowadays, and I don't say this to throw stones. I don't believe that throwing stones is good for the kingdom. But I also know that some pastors and churches teach this idea that if you choose to follow Jesus, everything is going to be easy street from then on out. And here's what I have to say to that. There, I do believe following Jesus will bless your life. However, it's not always gonna be the types of blessings that our earthly human minds comprehend. And so we don't follow Jesus because he always makes life better. We follow Jesus because he's always better than life. He's always better than life. And we have to know that opposition is going to come in our lives. So the more you strive to follow the Lord, the more we're going to face opposition. And my prayer is that we as a church, when we wake up every day and our feet hit the floor, that Satan and all of hell says, oh no, they're awake. Isn't that, isn't that the goal? That if we wanna be on mission, that when we wake up, Satan and all of hell should say, oh no, they're awake. And so today, as we conclude this series called Rebuilding, where we've been looking at the Old Testament character of Nehemiah, I wanna talk to you about overcoming opposition. A few weeks ago, in chapter four, we talked about overcoming internal opposition. We talked about how the enemy uses discouragement in my life and in your life to try to thwart us from following God's plans. And then last week, my friend Brad Goh talked about defending the oppressed or defending the vulnerable in chapter five. And today, we're gonna talk about in chapter six, if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to go ahead and turn there in Nehemiah chapter six, and we're gonna talk about overcoming external opposition. And we're gonna see from Nehemiah's account that he faces three different types of external opposition, and I believe that they are the same types of opposition that we still face in our lives today, and my prayer is that it will be something that can help us in our lives. If you're brand new and just catching up, I wanna walk through where we are. The Israelites have been in captivity for about 70 years. They were released in three different waves to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. If you've been with us for the last several weeks, we talked about the first wave was led by Zerubbabel, or you might, if you were like me and grew up in Sunday school, as we used to call it, you might have heard it called Zerubbabel, because we used to say, say Zerubbabel helped clean up the rubble, right? All right, y'all been awake, that's awesome. Uh, and then the second wave was led by Ezra. He was a Torah scribe and a scholar, and his whole goal was to help rebuild the society spiritually. And then Nehemiah led the final wave and helped rebuild the wall. Now, what we're gonna see today is that wall was built in 52 days. It took him 52 days, and here's what I find about that. When we are following God's plan, how many of you know that, that God can do in days what it takes us to do in decades? That when we surrender to the Lord, even though we're gonna face opposition, we've gotta know when we follow God's plan, he will work in and through our lives. And so that's where we are. I wanna give you three observations of three different types of external opposition that we will face and how we can overcome it. Before we dive in, I wanna give you the main thought for today. If you have a listener guide, wave it in the air like you just do care. Awesome, here we go. The main idea is this, following Jesus will always come with opposition. Pause. You might be saying, Pastor, you should be more positive. Okay, I'm positive. Following Jesus will always come with opposition. It's just the reality of life. However, following Jesus will always help us overcome the opposition that we face. Well, the question then is, how do we overcome that opposition that we're going to face in this life. Nehemiah shows us in chapter six, the first thing he shows us is that we should not or we should don't be deterred by distractions. Y'all say distractions. So Nehemiah chapter six, verses one through four, it says, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. Verse two says, so Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Y'all say, oh no. That sounds like the bully that's like, hey, I'll meet you in the parking lot, right? <laughs> and look at how Nehemiah responds. He says, but I realized they were plotting to harm me 
And then in verse three, it says, so I replied by sending this message to them, I am engaged in a great work, so I cannot come. What a great response when we are faced with distractions to following after the Lord, we say, no, I'm engaged in a great work and I cannot go meet you. He says, why should I stop working to come out and meet with you? And then it says in verse four, four times, y'all say four times, they sent the same message and each time I gave the same reply. So this Sanballat guy and Tobiah, they are the bullies of this whole story, right? And they are trying to get Nehemiah to stop the work that he's doing And notice he does not succumb to the distractions that they're trying to throw his way. Nehemiah shows us that when distractions come in life, and if you haven't noticed, if you haven't lived long enough, they will come, they just look different for all of us. But when distractions come in life, this is what we should do. Focus on what God put in front of you and keep doing what God called you to do. Now that sounds incredibly simple, But yet, how many times in my life and in your life does a distraction come and it easily diverts our attention? For Nehemiah, it was this Sanballat and Tobiah, but for you, it might be other things. Distractions are inevitable in life, and I have found that they are especially true the more we try to follow Jesus. The more we strive to serve the Lord, the greater the enemy strives to distract us. Have you noticed that in your life? And I would argue if you haven't noticed it, and if I haven't noticed it, then maybe we're not following Jesus as closely as he's called us to follow him. So make no mistake about it, not only is the enemy trying to distract us, his ultimate goal is to destroy us. If you doubt that, look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, stay alert. Y'all say alert. Watch out your enemy, the devil, He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to, what does that last word say? Devour, right? John 10, 10 says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So his goal is ultimately to take us out and how do we overcome it? Well, it says in the latter half, I have come, this is Jesus saying, that they may have life and have it abundantly. So how do we overcome the the things that distract us and deter us and take us away from following the Lord? Well, simply put, we have to keep our focus on what God has put right in front of us. So that thing that he's called you to do, maybe it's being a mom, maybe it's your job, maybe it's something that he's called you to do to serve in the church. I don't know what your particular situation is like, but all of us have things that God has placed on our heart that he's called us to do And if we wanna overcome the distractions, we have to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is fixing our eyes on him. Craig Rochelle said it this way, the devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. He says, and then he says, it may be a fight to focus, I would add parenthetically on what God's called you to do, but he says, but it is worth the fight. Now that all sounds good and well, but here's what I found. Unless we identify what those things are that deter us, then it doesn't matter, right? Because what deters me might be different than what deters you. And so there's this counseling principle. I would know because I've been to counseling a few times in my life. We all need it. And so there's this counseling principle called name it to tame it. How many of you have heard this principle before? Nobody, perfect, I'm connecting, (laughs) awesome. So essentially the premise is if if you want to defeat it, you have to identify it, right? Imagine if you were a football team and you showed up, like if Dripping Springs showed up on Friday and we were like, who are we playing, guys? Like, I don't know, what do y'all think? That's not how they roll, right? They know their opponent, they have video, they, they analyze them, they study them, they practice, they, they prepare as if they're playing that opponent and we have to do the same thing as Christians as well. So here's some possible distractions for all of us. First, first of all, social media or our phones. It's a big one. Such a big one that I'm actually next week preaching on how Christians should handle social media. I would encourage you to come back. It's a pretty relevant thing nowadays. Now, caveat, I believe that social media can be one of the greatest gospel tools ever invented because when in human history have we been able to do this and it's all of a sudden all over the world? So there's great potential. However, there's also a great potential for devastation and destruction. So maybe for you, social media or your phones or media in general is a distraction for you. 
I read a study this past week that said in August of 2018, research from the UK's telecoms regulator reported that people check their smartphones on average every 12 minutes during their waking hours. With 71% saying they never turn their phone off, and it's probably even higher than this now, it says, and 40% say that they check their phone within five minutes of waking up. That's, I mean, that's just the world we live in, right? Now, there's not an inherent bad in that. I mean, a lot of you may say, the first thing I check is my Bible app when I wake up, and that's great. That should be our first response. But I've heard it said this way, why not go scriptural before we go digital? Go script, in other words, spend time in the word before we allow our phones and our days and our distractions to deter us from things that he's called us to do. Now, you may read your phone on a tablet and a device, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think many times, and I'm guilty of this myself, we just get up and go, and we don't focus on centering ourselves in our time with the Lord first and foremost. Maybe that's not a distraction for you. Maybe you flip your phone open and flip it closed, and it's not as much of a distraction for you. Um, You'll get that joke later. Um, Some of you are like, wait, I do have a flip phone. It's like, okay, we'll talk after class. Maybe it's a hobby that's become all-consuming. It started out as an actual hobby, and now it's consuming your time, your thought, your attention. Maybe it's a vice or an addiction. Here's another one. Perhaps pride and ego is distracting you from what God's called you to do. And if none of those connect, I know this next one connects, worry and fear. That we become consumed with the health report, our kids, our job, the thing that's just staring right in front of us and it distracts us from the purpose that God has placed in our life. My question I would ask today though is, are you aware of the thing or the things that God tries to use to deter you from living out your mission and living out your purpose that he's called you to live out. Most of us are somewhat aware, and even once we've identified them, we have to formulate a game plan to combat against those distractions. And that game plan simply looks like waking up every day, saying, Lord, help me to focus first and foremost on you, and help me chase after you in everything that I say and everything that I do, because if not, it's going to reduce our effectiveness for the kingdom. I've got a very simple illustration here. So I've got a cup of water here, and I've asked Joel to help me out because he looks a little parched. So I'm gonna ask him to just drink a sip of water here. I did not poison it, don't worry. So you can take a sip. Is it refreshing? It's it's okay, all right, it's marginal, right? So I'm gonna ask, so that's, how many straws do y'all see in here? Just one, right? So now if I give him a second straw and ask him to keep it on the outside, and try to sip the water, how effective is that? (laughs) Not exactly effective, is it? He's still very parched. Can y'all give Joel a great big round of applause? Thank you. It's a very simple illustration. I know it's not that profound, but I think many times in our lives, he's going to get more water now, (laughs) because he's actually more thirsty. But many times, we allow these things to creep into our life, and they deter our focus from what God's called us to do. And if we don't actually identify those things, and for some of us, maybe it's eliminating them, and for some of us, it may be just keeping a proper perspective on that thing. Because you, know, you can't just say, all right, well, I'm gonna get rid of my phone. That's not realistic. But there's that thing called the screen time regulator you know, that you have if you're on Instagram or social media and it says your screen time is up. How many of us click ignore, right? Ignore, ignore, ignore. I have it on my phone, and there are a lot of days where I click ignore rather than clicking on, God, I'm going to not ignore you. I'm gonna focus on you first and foremost. So if we wanna be all that God has called us to be, we have to have a singular focus on what he's called us to do. Do you have that kind of singular-minded focus on what he's called us to do? The second thing Nehemiah shows us is don't cave in because of critics. Y'all say critics. So in Nehemiah 6, verses 5 through 9, it says, The fifth time, y'all say fifth time, time. Sanballat's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. It says, there is a, can y'all read that word? It may be hard to read. What does it say? There's a rumor. That never happens. This was only in Old Testament times. Nobody spreads rumors nowadays. 
among the surrounding nations and Geshem tells me it's true that you and the Jews are planning to rebel and that is why you are building the wall according to his reports. You plan to be their king. Next verse. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you, look, there is a king in Judah. So look at what he says next. You can be sure that this report will get back to the king, so I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. He's making up a rumor about the guy, and he's saying, so you better come talk to me about it, and look at what Nehemiah responds with. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You're making up the whole thing. And then he goes on to say, they were just trying to intimidate us, imagining they could discourage us and stop the work, and then look at what he does. So I continued the work with even greater determination. So Sanballat is, is determined to distract Nehemiah. He starts with trying to pick a fight. The next thing he does is so he says, I'm gonna make up a rumor about him. Now, how many times in my life and in your life are we tempted to get caught up in gossip and the latest rumors, right? It's, if it's not a temptation for us to participate, it's an even greater temptation for us to listen to it, right? If we aren't careful, we can let the latest gossip deter us from what God wants us to do. And I want you to key in on what he says in verses eight and nine. He says, I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. And then he goes on to say, so I continued the work with even greater determination. What is he doing? He shuts down the critics with the truth. He knows that what they're saying is not true. So in other words, he overcomes trash talk with truth. So the temptation for all of us is to get caught up in gossip when people are talking about us, isn't it? I know I'm not the only one that's ever sat there and been worried about what other people are saying. Maybe none of you struggle with that, and if you do, more power to you, but I think for all of us, we need to be able to let what people are saying go in one ear and out the other. Now, I'm not saying we should be impervious to people trying to have discussions with us. That's part of being a good Christian is being able to be approachable. However, when I was early in ministry, a pastor friend of mine told me, Russell, eat the meat and spit out the bones. In other words, learn the truth, because there may be truth in what people are saying, but we shouldn't spend our lives worrying and worrying and worrying and worrying and worrying about what they're saying rather than gleaning the truth. As we spend time with the Lord, we say, Lord, is that true? Is that, is that true what they're saying or is it not true? And so we learn, but then we get rid of the rest and we move on. Now you might be saying, Russell, that's easier said than done. How exactly should I go about doing this? The Apostle Paul shows us in Philippians 4.8. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is, what does that word say? True. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So if people are saying something that's not true about you, as Elsa says, let it go, <laughs> let it go, right? Let it go. You learn the truth and you let go of the rest. And so I channeled my inner Texan for this next part of your listener guide. If it ain't true, don't think about it. I know ain't ain't a word, but I just made it a word. If it's not true, don't think about it. There's this great quote I read this week that says, life is too short to tolerate nonsense. Cut out negativity, ignore gossip, and let go of fake people and their drama. Ignore those, the next quote I read, ignore those people who are constantly talking about you behind your back because they're right where they belong, behind you. That many times we, we give too much credit to what people are saying and we, we know what's true between us and the Lord and the rest of it we've gotta be willing to let go. Now I was trying to think of a story to illustrate this and uh, I told a story early on after when I was called here about um, my very short-lived days in minor league baseball, and there was this fan that everyone called the Toast Man. Um, I've got a picture here of this, that's literally him. This is not, like, so he is a real person, and he's a fan in Charleston, West Virginia, and what he does is when you're an opposing player and you come in and you strike out, he gets the whole stadium to say, you are toast, you are toast, you are toast. It's kind of embarrassing, right? And so I go back to this same league my second year, 
And my very first at bat, I walked up to the whole stadium saying, King of Toast, King of Toast, because he figured out I struck out a lot the year before. And so he got the whole stadium to label me the King of Toast, right? It's really, really uh, awesome. And so, yeah, it's a reason why I'm not playing anymore, ladies and gentlemen. People are like, oh, it's cool, you play for the Astros. Like, ah, it was really short-lived. Don't look up my batting average because it's not that, not that great. But I didn't finish that story. So as the whole stadium's chanting King of Toast, I heard it, of course, you can't not hear it. And I tried my best to focus on the task at hand. I didn't finish the story the first time. And so my first at bat, I didn't strike out, thank the Lord. So I didn't get labeled your toast again. My second at bat, I didn't strike out. Now let me give a caveat. This is probably one of like three home runs I hit in my entire career. But my third at bat, I proceeded to hit like the farthest home run of my entire professional career. And I run around the bases. This was not very Christ-like of me. I was not following the Lord. I looked at the guy and I kind of gave him one of these and then went back to the dugout. But my point in saying that is I didn't let the criticism get in my head too much. And I think many times, I know for a fact we have an enemy that's saying, you are toast, you are toast, you are toast. And what we have to do as Jesus followers is say, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Not because, I, yes, I am in myself, but because I follow Jesus, I'm not toast. He has great things in store for my life. And so you and I have to focus on what God's called you to do, not what others are saying about you. Not what others are saying about you. Do we do that? Do we actually overcome the criticism that we face in life? So Nehemiah shows us we've got to not be deterred by distractions. Don't let critics overrun you or get you down. And then finally, he, said, he shows us don't let fear or bullies overrun you. Look at verses 11 and, 10 and 11 and 13 through 15. He says, later, I went to visit Shemaiah, son of Deliah. My, my uh, pronunciation was... was uh, on practice this week. Crystal, as I was meeting with her going over slides, she said, good luck with pronouncing these names this week. I was like, thank you. And grandson of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the doors shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. And then look at how Nehemiah responds. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? Nehemiah says, no, I won't do it. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Then this next part is so key, verse 14. It says, remember, oh my God. That word, remember, I want want you to pay attention to that. It says, in all the things that evil Tobiah and Sanballat have done, and look at what it says again. It says, remember, y'all say remember. Remember. Noadiah the prophet and all the prophets like her who have tried to intimidate me. Next verse. So on October 2nd, The wall was finished just 52 days after we had begun. Notice that he is not intimidated by these people that are trying to attack him. Bullies aren't just for student ages. Have you noticed that? That every stage of life is filled with people that try to walk over people around them. And Nehemiah stands up to these guys. And that word he uses there, he says, remember, oh my God, that, say, that word remember is this word zakar in Hebrew. Y'all say zakar. So that word actually, it doesn't just mean like I happen to remember a memory. It's an active word. It means to recall or to rehearse or to remind yourself. It's the same word he used in chapter four, verse 14, where he says, don't be afraid of the enemy, remember the Lord. And he's talking to the men in chapter four, He's saying, who is great and glorious, fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, and fight for your homes. He's challenging the men to rise up and lead. He's modeling in chapter four and chapter six what godly male leadership looks like. Now I wanna talk to the men for a moment because if you look around our country, we live in a very blessed country. How many of you are thankful for our country that we live in? We live in an amazing country, amen? It's an amazing country. However, our world in general, if you haven't noticed, has some problems, right? And what is interesting about a significant number of the problems we face today, they can be traced back to lack of male influence 
or lack of a father's influence. Some specific things. The number one cause of crime, homelessness, poverty, unwed pregnancy, and future fatherlessness is lack of male influence. I wanna say that one more time to let it sink in. Crime, homelessness, poverty, unwed pregnancy, future fatherlessness. It's kind of depressing a little bit, isn't it? And it's, it's rampant everywhere. However, on the flip side, I wanna show you what happens when men step up and lead by example. So I'm gonna show you the percentage of times that an entire family comes to Christ when one family member comes to Christ. So when a wife or a mom comes to Christ, 18% of the time, the entire family comes to the Lord. It's amazing, right? It's part of the reason why Mother's Day is actually one of the highest attended Sundays in church across the country. You've got Easter, you've got Christmas. For most churches, Mother's Day is the next highest attended Sunday. Because mom's in charge, and what does mom want to do? She wants to go to church. Sometimes God works from the ground up, and when a child comes to Christ, 22% of the time, the entire family comes to Christ. Do you want to see what it looks like when a dad or a father comes to Christ? 94% of the time, the entire family comes to Jesus. Men, dads, future dads, husbands, we need to rise up. We live in a world that is in trouble. And so for us as Jesus followers, if we wanna make a difference, if we wanna overcome opposition, we've gotta to continue to stand up and lead our families, our homes, our schools, our children by an example. And Nehemiah shows us that he doesn't run from opposition. What does he do? He stands up to it. How many of you have ever heard of the illustration of what a buffalo does in a storm. A, a cow runs away from a storm. I've got a picture here of a buffalo. They run through the storm because they know that the best way to get through it is standing up to it and going through it. That's what we're called to do as Jesus followers. When a storm comes and news flash, they will come, we've got to rise up and stand up to it. The principle we see from Nehemiah is if we want to overcome opposition, we can't run from it, we need to stand up to it. Now here's the bad news. The bad news is that we can't do it ourselves. Sorry, we can't do it ourselves. Here's the good news. He's already done it for us. He's already done it for us. We can't do this alone, but Jesus can help us do it. John 16, says, in this world, you will have trouble. Pastor, be more positive. Okay, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. I'm positive that you will have trouble, but look at what he says, but take heart, why? Because Jesus has overcome the world. I'll close with this story. It's a story I read this week about a guy, and he was writing as an adult, and he was talking about a time at camp that he went to as a kid, and he said in this story, I was not a big kid, I wasn't a small kid, he said, I was just kind of average. I was running the mill. And he said, one night, he was on the bottom bunk, and the kid that was above him was a smaller kid and was the type that was pretty easily picked on. And so one night, he was going to sleep, and he woke up to overhear two of the bullies in the cabin had come over to their bunk and was picking on the kid above him. And particularly, these bullies were trying to get the kid above him to give him their candy. I know it sounds trivial in our state of life, but that was probably a very real thing to them. And this, this kid on the bottom, as he's writing the story, he said, I wasn't an overly courageous guy. I wasn't an, a big guy. But he said, as I was hearing this interaction happen, he said, I heard my friend above me, and I heard the quiver in his voice because he was so afraid. And he said, in that moment, something just came over me. And he said, I stood up, got right in those bullies' faces. They were probably way taller than him. And he said, hey, this cannot and will not happen. And the bullies were kind of taken aback for a second. They tried to argue back and he cut them off. He said, this cannot and will not happen. And because he stood up to them, the bullies went and sat down and left him alone. Church, I'm here to tell all of us today, 
when the enemy comes to attack us, we need to be the type of people that because of Jesus, we say, this cannot and this will not happen. We can't do it on our own. We have to rely on Jesus. And as we do that, if we want to overcome opposition, we walk with Jesus and watch how he helps us overcome the trials that we face in life. Amen.